Bible says we must present ourselves as a living sacrifice. How many of you know that you do not belong to yourself? Amen. That we belong to him. So I mean, the words of the song say, I give myself give myself away. But I mean, like, that's just for us because we already belong to him. There's, there's no way you can give somebody back something that's already there. Somebody that you brought a car. You're like, yo, I'm going to get this back to you, man. No. <laughs> This is the part of the service where we would like to um, recognize those who may um, have been, um, who may be worshiping with us for the very first time. Is there anyone in the um, congregation? Okay. Amen. 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 Would you like to say anything? No, I'm just glad to be here. What's up? What's up? Uh, would this be anyone's last Sunday worship with us? Amen. So we're all brothers and sisters in Christ and hopefully we'll see each other again next week. God will. Um, We'd like to say maybe the next um, two to three minutes, three to five minutes of the service. So I get up and welcome my brothers and sisters in Christ with a holy handshake and have a hug. And we'll get back to the worship and worship and we'll be Thank you.
here in this place at Hkaya and to be the body of Christ and serve each other and pray for each other. And so I'd like to ask, what praises and prayer requests do we have that we want to share this evening? Yes, sir. My Aunt Patricia uh, had a stroke this weekend. Pray for you. Patricia, right? Yes. Yes. Others? Continue prayer for my families and the great Yes, Chaplain, I would like to continue to pray for my sister Linda. She's recovered from her stroke. Thank Go before the Lord in time of prayer. Lord, you give us each new day as a, a great gift. And as the song says, we give ourselves away back to you. We give ourselves away to each other. We give ourselves away to let people know that you are a great and good God. That you are gracious that you are slow to anger, that you are quick to forgive your people. Lord, we give thanks for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, in our lives. We give thanks that we have come to know Him. We give thanks that uh, He has won for us a resurrection to eternal life and life with you eternal. We give thanks for the creation, Lord, that you have given to us, the beauty of this earth, and every time the sun rises, we give you praise. It is a new opportunity, Lord, to share in our mission and ministry that you have given to us. Each new day, we give ourselves away. Lord, we pray and give thanks for this wonderful community, this body of believers. We give thanks for those faithful that have gathered together this evening to worship you, Lord, to stand up and sing praises to you, Lord, to testify to their faith in you, Lord. Heal us from our sins. Forgive us for the things that we have left, the things that we have left undone, the things that we have done, the things that we have said, and the things we have left unsaid. Heal us from our anger, Lord. Take away the blindness of hate in our lives and guide us to be true images of you in this world. Heavenly Father, we in this community, we give thanks for this time together and this great and joyful experience. We are surrounded, Lord, by so much terror and so much strength. But in the midst of all of that, we will always praise you. Lord, for those who suffered so much in this country and continue to suffer injustice and terror. We pray, Lord, for your peace and your justice, that your light would shine greatly in this country. We pray for your healing in the lives
lives of those who've been attacked just these like this last week and bombings of mosques and other places in the area. Heavenly Father, we lift up before you all of those who are suffering in any way and ask for your healing touch on their lives. And especially, we lift up before you Patricia and Linda who suffered a stroke. We pray for the doctors and nurses that are serving them and caring for them and working about to be part of your healing in their lives. We pray for their family members who worry and pray and wonder. Give them a sense of your great care and comfort in their lives. Heavenly Father, we pray for all of those who are traveling. We give thanks for those who have come back in our midst. We give thanks for those that are going home to spend some time with family. We give thanks for all of those joyful times. But Lord, in the midst of traveling, we ask for your bless safe blessings upon your lives. And that you would give each of us the opportunity in our travels to share your message. Help us in all of the things of our lives, Lord, to resist the temptations that are out there. Give us your strength. Help us to turn only to you. Help us to follow your will. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we pray for all of these things. Lord, we pray that you would hear the prayers that we offer now in this moment of silence. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in the power of Christ and the gifts of the Spirit. Amen. Amen.
Hey, man, church, let's give a hand of praise for that. You know, that is our deepest desire, that Jesus would come and our desire as the church to be prepared, like the song said, as a bride for the groom that is coming. And so as we prepare ourselves, we're going to study tonight's gospel lesson. And, and uh, really, this gospel lesson is, uh, I don't want to reveal too much, but it's about who we belong to and, and, and what belongs to God and and, and uh, the idea also of uh, giving ourselves back to God and how funny that is because all things are God's. But there is a need for us to sacrifice ourselves. There is a need for us to, to give ourselves over to God to recognize that it is God that created us, that it is God that has redeemed us. And so in tonight's gospel lesson, from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 26th, 22nd chapter, verses 15 to 22. And if you could just kind of scroll through the, the screen and the slides and the images as I'm going there. You can either read along in your Bible, or you can kind of watch along up here. There's going to be some images of this Gospel lesson. Again, Matthew, the 22nd chapter, verses 15 to 22. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap Jesus in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us, then, what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this? And whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. And when they heard this, they were amazed. And they left him and went away. This is the gospel of the Lord. Grace, peace, and mercy are yours from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. How many of you are Star Wars fans? Okay, so Star Wars, uh, a, a movie, uh, a space opera that originally came out in the, in the 1980s? 70s. 77 was the first one, right? But then uh, Empire Strikes Back came out. 80s? And then Return of the Jedi, and then it took a dip after that, and it started to work its way back up. There's, there, there, but anyway, in the Return of the Jedi, the, we set the scene for you. There's an emperor, just like in today's story. There's an emperor, and he has a giant space station, which everyone believes to be almost ready, but not quite operational. And the, the rebels, they're coming with their fleet to try and attack and destroy this Death Star thing, as they call it. And as they kind of come in close to the Death Star, the Death Star all of a sudden kind of comes to life and shoots this giant laser beam at them. And there is one person who's in charge of the rebel fleet. His name is Admiral Akbar, and he looks like a squid. But he has this famous phrase where he yells out, It's a trap! In today's gospel lesson, the disciples are seeing what's going on, and they must be thinking to themselves, the Pharisees are coming here, and the Herodians are coming here, and they're together, and they're asking Jesus this question, Jesus, don't answer, it's a trap! Jesus is like, hold on. I got this. Don't you worry. We're good. And tonight's gospel lesson, 
There is an unholy alliance that happens between the Pharisees and the Herodians. So let's talk a little bit about who these people are. In the Gospel lessons, the Pharisees always get a bad rap for who they are, and deservedly so. But let's talk about who they originally were. When Israel was conquered, and when Judah was conquered, and they were thrown out to Persia and to Babylon and all of those places, they had to figure out how to be the people of God spread out around all of the places of that kind of known part of the world. Because what it meant to be a Jew originally was, I have a Davidic king, I obey the Torah, I sacrifice the right things at the temple, and I live in the Holy Land. Well, now you've taken away the Davidic king, you've taken away the sacrifices at the temple, and you've taken away the Holy Land. What do I have left? And it's this idea of practicing the Torah. And so the Pharisees were the religious leaders that would come along and they would help the Jewish people, whether it be in Persia or Babylon or wherever, help them practice and live out their faith. That's commendable. That's good. That's a great start. But like all things, it turns into a bureaucracy. And all of you know how hard it can be to deal with a bureaucracy that has outlived its usefulness. It starts to become a self-licking ice cream cone. How many of you have heard that phrase before? It starts to perpetuate itself and create more and more rules and more and more burdens. So even after Cyrus of Persia allowed the Jewish people to come back to their Holy Land, allowed them to rebuild the temple, allowed them to engage in sacrifices to God again, allowed them to live in the Holy Land and practice all of those other things, the Pharisees were still laying on them the heavy burdens. So much so that they declared it illegal to help another human being who was hurting on the Sabbath. Because that was work. And it was not proper to do work on the Sabbath. That's why when Jesus is running around healing people on the Sabbath, they get extraordinarily upset. Now the Pharisees enjoyed a great deal of power. They were able to kind of run things in and around that area of Jerusalem and other areas. They were able to make religious pronouncements about what should happen and what should not happen. They were making themselves rich off of that as well. And so they were very comfortable with this status quo situation. And Jesus is there upsetting the apple cart. Jesus is telling them in parables and other things that they are not carrying out God's will, that they are teaching the people poorly, that they are leading people away from God and not to God. In fact, just before this, and one of the reasons why they say then the Pharisees went and plotted out against them, he had just told a parable about, the, about people invited to a wedding feast, and they did not come, and so God... Had, or the, the person that did the invite had this wrathful vengeance against those that were invited and invited all of the poor and the rabble from the street to come on in. And the Pharisees, rightly so, knew that Jesus was talking about him or them. And so they plotted to entrap him. Then there's also the Herodians. The Herodians are a rather interesting bunch. They're Jewish people. But they are fans of the Greek way of things. They're fans of Herod. They see Herod as a good person who tempers Rome, who kind of keeps Rome off of their backs. They like the, the Greek influence of things. In fact, many of them will have engaged in polytheistic worship. They'll have said, okay, there's Yahweh God, there's Zeus. Mars, Venus, all of the other gods of the Roman or Greek pantheon. They think that Herod does a great job of keeping the centurions at bay. And that Herod is the only one that is capable of doing that. And so they are fans of Herod. Some of them, purportedly, believe that Herod was a messiah of God. If you can imagine that. 
This guy was busy slaughtering pigs on God's altar. So there's the Herodians and the Pharisees. And these two form an alliance. The Pharisees who are busy about themselves, trying to protect their own status, but who are supposed to be teaching the people of Israel about what it means to follow after God, are partnering with those who willingly worship after other gods, who proclaim Herod as Messiah, all because they're angry at this young, brand new preacher. This brand new rabbi who's going to upset the apple cart. They're more interested in keeping the status quo and their own power on both sides than being about bringing in the kingdom of God, being about serving in the kingdom of God. They are blinded so much so by their hatred of Jesus that they can't see that this is the one that John prophesied about. This is the one that Isaiah and Jeremiah and all the prophets talked about. That this is the Messiah. That this is the one who's going to bring about the kingdom of God. They're so blinded. So my brothers and sisters in Christ, one thing that we need to learn from this is that when we encounter those that they're more interested in preserving their position than they are about in sharing the faith and being about bringing about the kingdom of God, you need to be suspicious of that. They probably have an ulterior motive because they're most concerned about their own status quo and not about serving. This unholy alliance of Pharisees and Herodians in order to attack Jesus, they decide to try and trap him in some sort of questioning game. And so it's interesting, the Pharisees, they're not quite even all in on this game. If you notice, the scripture says they send their disciples. So they send their underlings, their amateurs. And maybe they're thinking, well, if our amateurs can cause Jesus to falter or catch him in some way, that'll show that Jesus isn't as smart as he thinks he is. But if their amateurs get beaten by Jesus, they, they were just amateurs. So they're hedging their bets. They're not all in on what they believe. Either. That might be a caution also to you as you're meeting with others, engaging with others. How much are they willing to lay themselves on the line for what they do? These Pharisees, they're sending their disciples. They're not even going to go ask these questions. Now what happens next is interesting. Here's another thing for us to see and to learn. They go in and they say, teacher, rabbi, teacher, we know you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one for you do not regard people with partiality. It's a trap! You all know that when someone starts saying really nice things about you, 